Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Architects Podcast. We're continuing our uh, sort of live in-person recordings and, and episodes uh, here from Redmond. Um, if you hear what sounds like vacuum cleaners or background music or things like that, uh, it's because A, our production person, post-production person, uh, Mr. Nick, has not been able to remove it from the recording. But B, more importantly, it's because we're actually in public spaces and uh, you know we're doing sort of finding little spots where we can actually record and, and, and grab guests and, and actually uh, you know just make it happen. So you know, forgive us for for some of those things, but we'll do our best to kind of fix it. But uh, like I said, here again, once again with uh, with Nicholas Blank. How are you doing, Nick? Hey, Chris. We had half an hour of sunshine today. <laughs> Not right. We noticed because you know the wind blew, and I think parts of my body fell off because the wind was blowing so cold. I, I think my brain's still trying to catch up with my body, right? I That's feel right. That the jet lag has been very real for me this trip, which is kind of weird, but you know it is what it is. Right? And I, I do have to tell you, folks, that uh, we have been trawling through the corridors, and we came across this innocent-looking person called Camilla, and we dragged her into this sounds terrible but we we found a, a place where we could record and we said you have an interesting story to tell so camilla welcome to the show and tell our audience who you are and what do you do well hi thank you i i like that you think i'm innocent <laughs> i played you i did it i'm kidding <laughs> it so <worked. laughs> yeah i am camilla martins i work for microsoft as a senior pro, uh, product manager and i focus on a new microsoft solution called uh, security Service Edge, or SSC, and we are getting into this new uh, technology space, so I'm here to talk about that. Chris, do you know what that is? Huh. You know, I, I we followed the announcement, right? And I think yeah. we actually talked about the announcement specifically on the show, and we had Van Hybrid kind of try and break it down for us just a little bit. But I do think it's a new thing, and I'm, I think that for a lot of our audience, this technology and this Microsoft breaking into the space is definitely a new thing. So can you, if I'm, you know, uh, I'm first, you know, hearing about this for the first time, what sort of problems or what sort of challenges does it solve for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about uh, SSC itself as a technology space is not very new. It has been uh, happening for a few years. There are plenty of excellent vendors in this space operating. Mm -hmm. It is new for us as Microsoft. So we are now launching new uh, products, tooling that can uh, align with that type of solution. And the reason why it exists in the world is just to, again, address the constant motion that everything happens, right? So we have users, devices, applications. They used to be in a single place. Then we started securing things. So we were buying appliances and devices that we we're putting down in our data centers or in our headquarters to secure the network, to secure the data. But now everything is everywhere. And now you also are running those appliances in other clouds and then in other data centers. And it, the whole thing just becomes completely crazy. Uh, the traffic is going back and forth in multiple directions. Now, sometimes you are also like rerouting traffic far away from you just for the security. That's You're right. routing all the way back to where the user was. It, it just doesn't work. So the SSCs are to solve for that. So basically, it is your... Traditional security infrastructure running in a cloud service that we are all, any of the vendors will refer to the edge, right? So the edge is responsible to receive the traffic. It doesn't matter where the user is. It doesn't matter which type of device that the user is, is using. Traffic goes into the edge. Your edge is smart enough to have whatever security things that you configure that, that you want to do. And from there, the access is granted to the final destination. So you're no longer having to route traffic far away just to route it right back. You're no longer having to manage so many different appliances in so many different locations for your security needs. Everything is in a central place. Yeah. Uh, and this is why uh, this industry exists and why many customers are predicted mm. to actually migrate into this type of solution in this next uh, uh, coming five to 10 years. So there's a more of a context there. And some of that context is that you talked about edge, but that edge could exist in my building or it could exist outside of my building. And what you're able to do from a product point of view is you have an intranet edge and you've got an internet edge. Do you mind just talking us through that? Well, the edge as a service, so the ones that we that we would call it that we are offering, mm -hmm. would be that 
external to you, right? So that edge is not uh, something running in your building. It's basically running as a service in our Microsoft infrastructure. And you can count on all of the high availability that we have, the uh, geo availability, right? It's distributed around the world. So yeah. you have um, low late, or we're expecting to have low latency. And the intranet, uh, so if you have an edge on your own, that is going to be your basic uh, networking uh, egress routes, right? So whatever type of service providers that you have to grant to access to the internet, that would be considered your own, that you manage, that you choose. Mm -hmm. Could even be a 5G connection. It doesn't matter as long as the user has access to the, to the internet somehow. Now, I don't know if you were alluding to the fact that we can protect applications that are living in the internet and applications that are living in the intranet or we would call them private apps so that was more what you were alluding to I, I was going there and one of the things we can do for example or the promise of is that even though i've got this crusty old uh can i call it my 24 year old attack platform called active directory what is that i never heard of it i can do modern things inside my existing data center with Protocols that were never designed, for example, to have a second factor. Correct. Yeah, I'm like, correct and pause. Yeah. Just take a breath for drama effect. <laughs> uh, I actually, I am getting uh, very, like, not surprised, but I'm just kind of in love with that subject a little bit because it feels like we all know it mm. and it's still happening. It's like, it's an old topic yeah. and we have had so many solutions come and go or still exist it doesn't matter but i'm like the problem still seems to exist mm -hmm. so the situation is uh let's say we used to have our apps running back in the day on prem we, we tend to call them line of business apps yeah they may be running whatever protocols that are totally off they could be that are not traditional http https but who knows okay whatever some SQL, MySQL backend that you're doing direct connections with a thick client that somebody coded in 1999. Like, yes, I don't know, right? Yes. So the point is, you can't, like, the companies started the motion to migrate or modernize their apps. And then some of these applications generally, for some reason, they're always important. Yeah. Like, they're always the ones that your company lives on and they are just too hard to modernize yeah. or they can, or if they were to modernize them, they can't take the downtime to do so. Mm -hmm. So those lingered. Yes. They st still stay. So even if companies decided to like migrate like 80% of their stuff and their users and their directories and they're in the cloud and everything is way more modern, etc., there's still going to be like this two, three, four apps that for some reason can't easily be migrated or cannot be easily secured to the level of security that we need today because hmm. they don't even understand modern off, hmm. right? They're still running who else? what? Uh, but that is the solution that we're bringing today. It's uh, one of the two products that uh, is part of the SSC solution is the Microsoft Intra Private Access. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our early adoption during these previews that we've been having, we've seen truly it resolve for these problems that customer have, mm -hmm. customers have been having. So with private access, you are able to now use like the power of conditional access in front of these applications that are running not so traditional ports or protocols, mm. and it will work, TCP, UDP, uh, any types of ports. And you can now say, you know what, even though maybe the app itself living internally in my old, you know, data center, in it. Uh, even though it may not understand modern auth and I cannot put MFA in front of it, I can keep it tight. I keep it hidden in, in there in the private network, but I can put now this private access in front of it and with conditional access policy before you can get to it. Mm -hmm. And then when you put a conditional access policies in, policy in front of it, now you get to use whatever mm -hmm. amazing features that conditional access policies have, mm -hmm. including MFA. Yeah. So then you get to say now, require MFA via a conditional access policy to this old school app that I just can't put MFA in front of, generally speaking, or not easily. Dang. That has been a huge differentiator and is hitting the market customers for sure. It would, right? Because that's a really, it's a really difficult problem to solve, right? And I've, I've recently been involved in a, an uplift similar to this, right? A very old application written... 15 years ago, um, you know, using the standards of 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Uplifting something like that into the cloud is very difficult. 
and it required still ongoing code changes, authentication changes, right? Because Com complete the, refactoring, right? Because the 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 the, the alternate solution to that is you have to make it now understand Azure AD and SAP, Enter ID and SAML, right? And and those types of modern protocols. In it's a difficult thing. So, did you just say modern protocol and SAML in the same breath? <laughs> But but um, I, I think it makes it makes a lot of sense um, to to be able to provide something like this where uh, you know those legacy applications. You know, I like the the technical debt that uh, yeah. you know a lot of uh, a lot of organizations have sort of adopted over the years and collected. Um, be, having a solution to to be able to give them some time to do that refactoring, right? Because ultimately, yeah. you still you don't want to stop the process of 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 uplifting your application because chances are if it's using legacy authentication methods mm -hmm. there's other stuff within that application that's probably also problematic right um and and so instead of just saying well you know you have to now move this thing in an incredibly quick time you've got some time to 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 work through it but we can still protect the application protect access to the application um i have a concern with that okay because we all know that this temporary fix becomes permanent. So, but I I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, but I think that the the problem has been for so long mm -hmm. that it's just no longer it's it's not even a temporary patch. It's not even just a band aid anymore mm -hmm. because uh, it's it, it, it these are sometimes critical apps, right? Uh, it's the 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 level of impact on the business is just really hard yeah. to to just make uh, the transition even if they had a group of people and time just the business impact of maybe pausing the operations or causing some disruption in the operations some companies can't touch that mm. and who knows the dependencies that those apps might have too i'm not even getting there because yeah. who knows what's behind them but yeah. but i think i agree that there's a risk of saying oh now i can secure it so i don't have to ever modernize it etc but I wouldn't mind that because, first of all, it's eliminating some, you know, yeah, addressing you're, some You're risk. still better off than you yeah, were before. Right. You're addressing right. a risk, but it's been like that for a long time. So okay. it's not like they're going to, mm. it's just been like that. So mm. it's going to keep being like that. You know, to, to, to use Tarek, um, Tarek's uh, sort of analogy or, or, or for this is you don't have to outrun everyone. You just have to outrun <laughs> the slowest person, right? Yes. If you're being chased by a bear... And we did talk about bears earlier, <laughs> given, given our wonderful uh, scenery here. If you're being chased by a bear, you only have to outrun the slowest one, right? And doing something still puts you ahead of folks that, that do, nothing. do nothing. Yes. And, and technically speaking, like the risk in general, it's always, even, even though we are very modern and the world is changing, a lot of the times, most of the breaches and hacks and things that happen are the ones that we kind of knew about like yeah. are the ones that were like man i knew this was uh, uh at risk or vulnerable mm. and it, it's hardly ever it happens when the zero days come and when it's something that wow a genius came up with this hack and <laughs> yeah. who would have thought of it it is rare like the the majority of the issues that the we have as security people it mm. I, i'm calling myself security people and I'm, but i, I am <laughs> but i'm like the majority of issues are generally those that were preventable yeah you know, and, uh, and that we were aware of. So I think investing in that is very valid, mm. uh, especially with the doing, you know, beyond a single layer of authentication can help just prevent so much problems. I want to ask you, why do we care that Microsoft has an SSE product? There's others in the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I mean, I, I am super honest, like I work for Microsoft, but... It is a matter of bringing what uh, what we can do that's best for the customer. So, for example, I think it's possible that a Microsoft solution may not be best for every customer, mm -hmm. right? But we, I know it will be excellent for many customers. Mm. So, we have a couple of things that we're very proud of right now, like our obviously our global network. So. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, it's a big network, right? Yeah. I, yes. We've talked about it in the past and then and yeah. sort of shared the, some of the statistics of just how large this network is. Yeah. It's worth being proud of because it's a pretty impressive it network. And we can rely. So basically this this type of service, it's it's security. It's security, security when a traditional, traditional network security thing joining itself with identity, which we are the leaders in. Mm. And then, so we're like, if we can combine this wealth of knowledge in capabilities that we have in identity which we are you know leading the charts there we're good mm. 
if we can combine that now and 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 with our globally distributed points of presence mm. and bring in solutions that now start aligning with the network security layer without expecting customers to have to manage network traditional network security appliances and things like that it combining these two is a huge like lift off of management uh in in, in probably cost so it's it that's to me like the big differentiator to say microsoft can bring that uh we are uh we have the potential to bring this type of security without introducing late late introducing latency without introducing uh any types of performance issues from a purely you know connectivity perspective there around the globe right and then you can guarantee that user experience to be whatever you are you still get the same type of uh you know x to your apps and about the same time and hey. just move on yeah. with their life so so we talked about there being two components to to SSE, yeah. and then we talked about sort of private access being the the first of it. What's the what's the second part of this? Yes, so the second part is protecting internet applications, and internet applications would be apps that are publicly accessible. So it technically does not matter if it's an application that you run yourself, and you, but it's, it has a public endpoint, or if it's running like at a PaaS type of or SaaS type of uh, cloud. So as long as it's a public endpoint that can be accessed over the public internet, you can also protect those apps. So for that, one example would be a classic uh, secure web gateway type of capability. So like companies that want to make sure we're filtering the traffic to say, and it could be for multiple reasons. It could be just for productivity reasons. They can say, you know what? I do not want you guys on social media all the time. Mm. Let me block this down. Uh, so the traffic goes into the edge first, because that's your route. So user is working, goes into the edge, says no social media for you. Don't go there. Like we don't, we, we wouldn't let you. But then we can do things, uh, similar scenario, but for maybe some bandwidth consumption concerns. So we're like, you know, maybe some people, your developer, you love listening to music while you're working at the office. But now we have 300 developers streaming music mm. in, you know, and coding. And now our whole office internet connection is just like not working very well. So I want to not allow that. Yeah. So I can say, hey, let's block streaming services for be because of a true quality of service mm. concern versus I'm not worried. We don't worry about what you're doing, but we worry about the impacts that it has on the network itself yeah. with the mm. bandwidth. Mm. So you get to uh, apply those policies from the cloud and control the traffic based on those categories of destinations, mm. right? And you can even uh, layer it with identity controls. Mm. So then it will be even cooler to say, you know, um, if you are uh, if you are a marketing person, if you're in this marketing route, then it's okay for you to go to social media because that's part of your role. Mm. But if you're everybody else, let's focus on the job and, and, and block social media for those folks. So now you're starting to layer that. That's the connection I was saying is a network security, traditional mm. secure web gateway filtering mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. on top of making those decisions based on identity. Mm. So you can do that all through integration with conditional access. It's starting to sound very much like zero trust. <laughs> well, actually, before we go down that route, because you're talking about edges, right? Mm -hmm. Does that mean I need an appliance? You no, know, no. I'm like complicated answer. Uh, <laughs> yes and no. So right now, for, you're gonna say, well, how does if I have a user with their phone or with their, you know, computer, how does that device know that the traffic have to make it to the Microsoft Edge where the security policies are applied? So there are a couple of deployment models that we have. One of them requires an agent. Uh, we are working on getting this agent uh, fully integrated so it's easy, uh, so you don't have to work on distributing it manually. But in these preview stages that we are right now, you can go online, find the agent. It's called Global Secure Access Client. Uh, we have it available for testing on Windows platform and on Android platform with more OS's operating systems being supported soon. Uh, that agent is going to run on that machine and that agent's, uh, agent is authenticated with your user uh, that is on Intra uh, ID or hybrid joint or Intra ID joint. And then it pulls all the, the configuration settings that you define as an administrator and that's how the machine knows how to go to the edge what, depending on the traffic that you define. Mm -hmm. The second model is 
an agentless model. The second model, we call it remote networks. Mm -hmm. And for that one, you, I wouldn't call it an appliance, but you do need a traditional uh, network device. It could be a router or it could be a next generation firewall. It, as long as this device supports IPsec tunneling standard protocols, so we use uh, IKE version two, uh, IPsec tunneling, and it, and it should support BGP routing also. Mm -hmm. That is a, a great scenario for protecting like computers that are living in a single place. So yeah. think yeah. about yourself if you if you have you know uh, a bunch of supermarkets or if you have bank branches uh, and those computers are always there. No one takes that computer yeah. at the end of it, right? They, they don't go home with that computer. That computer stays there. Mm. IoT devices, anything, there are some printers, there might be some point of sales equipment. Mm. Those uh, devices that are on that network mm. can be protected by having a that router, right? With the IPsec tunnel, as long as it's within the same network. We are going to teach that those devices traffic via BGP routing that are going to be advertised, traffic goes to the edge. Mm -hmm. So that one is cool. It's agentless. You don't have to install anything uh, agent-wise on the machine, but it does require now a network equipment mm -hmm. at the site. But it's, it works great for those static branch style mm -hmm. uh, customer businesses. But it sounds like in that scenario, you probably already have the equipment there because you're providing internet access of some sort anyway. Unless you have a router from 1992. No. Right, right. But but also, I think that also sounds like that is something that then would support weird and random operating systems that maybe the agent doesn't support, okay. right? So if you have, you know, Raspberry Pi is doing some sort of controller, or, you know, in your refrigerator, mm -hmm. you could still sort of, you know, I don't know why you, you still have that. those pies in your refrigerator, dude. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yep. Well, you know, you you would have pies in the refrigerator, but I don't think you're supposed to eat those raspberry pies. <laughs> well, they are very crunchy for some reason. <laughs> yes, but metal is delicious. Okay. Yes, but uh, but you know, if you were if you if you had some sort of IoT device that had to report into Azure, for example, for for tele telemetry purposes, uh, this is, sounds like a great solution for that. Mm -hmm. Whereas for folks who maybe to have a laptop and are going home to work three days a week, the agent might be a better choice because you know it didn't matter where they were their traffic was coming from if they had the agent it's going to still Correct. and exactly that so it yep. is about understanding how the customer works like what is your user base like where are you working from which types of devices are you using what is the state that you're protecting mm. and then you say there are a couple of architecture models do they fit do you use only one of them do you use both of them we don't know but it's a conversation that we have to have to solve for that customer need, right? And that goes back to me, like when you're saying, why Microsoft, you know, it's like always to me, it always is customer first. So I was like, um, analyze what you need. Mm -hmm. um, let's analyze the solutions that are available to you. Mm -hmm. They could be any of the other vendors in the, the market for this. They could be Microsoft and you're going to find a good match. And then you can find a good match based on many other things, right? There's actual technical capabilities. There may be some licensing. There may be some cost. There is like, I've, I've seen so many customers just really wanting to be vendor consolidated. Mm. So a customer may even consider the Microsoft option because they're like, you know what? It's much easier for me to just manage. Uh, I'm already managing so much of my security via Microsoft. It's easier for me to actually manage one more of these now here with instead of, you know, going somewhere else. So that, that also happens, actually. So. But it's a factor it, for decision. Yeah. So I was going to say, is this any sort of XDR type benefits here? Because you've got, yeah. you know, you've got alerts and signaling coming uh, potentially out of this as well that can roll up into Absolutely. your Sentinel instance and, and, you know. But we don't want to mix XDR and, and SEMA in this instance because right. we, we're not defending an endpoint. We're defending a network edge. So it's not really truly XDR or, or is it? I think it, it aligns, you know, because XDR, sh XDR should account for multiple types of signals that come from multiple types of resources. Mm -hmm. So now you can think about this as adding adding network signals to your XDR. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying I have, besides understanding my devo device endpoint signals, mm -hmm. the, it, it, now I also have my identity signals that I've always had. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I can also add some network layer signals yeah. there. And your XDR can make decisions based on that or at least inform you on unusual behavior or anything that might be happening so running SSC will be in that in that case you know from an operational perspective from a SOC perspective it will be bringing more data points 
mm. for the defense layer to keep an eye out and say what's going on, where are people connecting from, where are they connecting to, mm. right? And it will just add more information, more signals to a solution of that sort. Is that something we can say for sure we will see SSE signals in a Microsoft XDR console? I think that it's a little early for me to tell you. I know that that is definitely part of the plan. Okay. But I don't have a, a, a date or a when or how, but it's a, a huge consideration because it's supposed to it's supposed to empower not only, well, it's, it's supposed to be layered like the user experience. Mm -hmm. So the user should be able to just go connect to private app, public app. They don't know. Mm. They don't need to turn anything on and off. Mm. They don't need to do anything, basically. It just works for them. Yeah. It's supposed to be easier for the admin. So the admin is now maybe consolidating, managing everything from a single place. Uh, they managing it, don't have to worry about, you know, too many appliances or distributed things. That's it. And then if you have the defender, now you're enabling the defender if you have a SOC running and monitoring what's happening in your environment, keeping an eye on threats, keeping an eye on unusual behavior. That is part of our whole story. So we are enabling all of these different personas with this new tool and they, they will gain visibility of items that they didn't before to improve their XDR capabilities. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, uh, for me, conditional access is such a powerful tool, right? Yeah. So anytime you can integrate we can integrate new things into into CA. I think that that's I love that personally because that's very you know that's the work I do. That's a lot of the stuff I do with customers is is build out those types of layered defenses, right? And, yeah, yeah. And so I really I I love it anytime we can integrate yeah. and use it. So so Chris, it sounded like you wanted to ask a, a zero trust question. In fact, you were at the pool, you had your shorts on, and then I dragged you back <laughs> from the water. And we were talking about zero trust. What did you want to ask? Well, it's unheard of, actually, because you are the zero trust. You're ZT Nick, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I was, essentially what I was asking was, it sounded like this very much sort of um, obeys the principles of zero trust, right? And am I, am I right in thinking that um, at least some of the solution is, is very much uh, zero trust aware or zero trust focused? Yes, yes, you're right. So this type of solution definitely aligns with zero trust principles. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to internet access, obviously, it's verifying that you're the user, that you're coming from the device that you are going to the destination that you're allowed to. It's consistently checking for that. But I think when we talk private access, it gets even deeper, right? So private access now having micro tunnels, you can do app, app, app um, per app types of access that you can control. And it's really aligning with the ZTNA concept. So zero trust network access, which we're now applying to those internal private corporate apps, which historically have been known to have, you know, lateral movement, free for all kind of a situation when it's like, okay, I, get, I grant you access to my private app. My private app lives in my corp internal network. But once you're in there, Technically, if you want to scan around, look around, jump to the side server over there, you know, tech, a lot of times uh, the companies internally are not fully segmented and then you get the lateral movement. So private access definitely uh, brings that uh, improvement there, which is a total ZTNA solution, uh, being able to just do a little bit micro segmentation and we're going to continue to improve on that as we go. Mm. I think that's a good spiel for me to remind everybody mm. that these things I'm talking about are available for testing hands-on right now. So yeah. like if you go to the Microsoft documentation, look up uh, Microsoft SSC solution, intra private access, intra internet access, global secure access, all of the above, you will find step by step uh, instructions on how to deploy this, how to test it, and you can see if it's a good solution for your needs, too. That sounds an awful lot like that's an enterprise thing. But what about our small customers? Is that if I'm too small, can I not play in this? Not at all. I would say it works great for both. Uh, so from these learnings and tasks, we've been running really closely with customers. We've seen uh, satisfaction from both sides, yeah. right? So it, it, this type of solution can work for an enterprise customer that is already quite mature in their uh, security journey you know they are just improving and improving on top of that that's great but it works greatly for smaller customers too because it's uh easily configurable 
right? So the, the you're handling, you're able to just kind of handle everything in one place. Mm. Uh, the portal configuration settings are, are very, very easy for you to understand how the policies are applied. Mm -hmm. A lot of these customers are already using conditional access policies. So that's just like another layer on top of that. So you're already kind of used to what you're dealing with anyways, just expanding it a little bit more. Uh, and a lot of times we're seeing that it's perfectly like right-sized for small customers too. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes um, the best in class in the market is not what you need, Yeah. right? Like you do not need to pay top dollar for the best thing with all these extremely advanced capabilities when sometimes you need the basics. And like alluded to what we spoke before, I don't know, the 80-20 rule. Probably 80% of the breaches or the security issues that somebody can have is going to be resolved by a 20% settings over here and here and there. So small businesses are adopting this. They are using it. I would highly recommend you look into it. It's for everyone. That sounds amazing. I, I want to get personal for a moment, if I may. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can do it. So you were... Um, extremely in interested in languages mm -hmm. and you went from an interest in languages to being a security nerd mm -hmm. how i don't I, i'm like i don't know how uh it, it was a uh, life took me to, yeah. to this i think so i always loved languages since i was a child you know i am from brazil portuguese is my native language by the time i was 14 i could speak english and spanish fluently already i was like trilingual And I keep on learning. I never stop. But my first job ever was as an uh, in, uh, an English teacher as a second language. Wow. So I used to teach English in Brazil to my fellow Brazilians. Mm -hmm. And I, I got into um, IT mm -hmm. as a uh, Windows 2000 server administrator because I spoke English. Wow. So they hired, they said, the company that hired me, a huge uh, manufacturing company was like, we need people to monitor our Windows Server infrastructure mm -hmm. and we don't care what you know, we just need you to speak English fluently. Mm -hmm. That's that's what they needed. And they're like, we'll teach you, train me on the job. Mm -hmm. So I got taught on the job. I got an NCSA back in the day, whatever. I don't even know. Yeah. But um, that's what how I started. But from there, from doing that first IT job, The security thing just kind of like happened naturally. I think I was given an opportunity by one of the one of my managers at some point. He just saw the way I worked and he said, you're very focused on keeping things tidy, keeping things clean, you know, like so I wanted to start driving some of the security, mm -hmm. internal security practices for the small company. And that's how I started. So then, but that's been like 16 years. Okay. Well, we love, we love to hear everyone's journey and how they kind of get to where they or got to where they are right because i think for a lot of us it was a very straight line like for me i always knew it was the it you know since i was 15 years old it was always going to be yeah what i did right and it, it's just a sort of a very straight line but it's yeah. great to hear these stories of folks who kind of go into you know the arts or into some something else and sort of find their way almost sort of as if being pulled right yeah Uh, I love it. I love hearing those types of stories. It was a surprise for me, actually. Yeah. I, not only did I not know or ever thought about it, not because, and I say this, like, it's not because somebody told me I, I, it wasn't for me. It just never really happened, really. Mm -hmm. Like, I I don't know. Yeah. But I fought it. So when I got offered the job, so first of all, it was my friend that said, Camila, sign up for this job. It paid, dub it paid double than the mm. t teaching job mm. paid. They're like, sign up. I'm like, I'm not going to go. I don't know anything. And they're like, it doesn't matter. You meet the criteria. The criteria is English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went. I got the job. When the hiring manager told me I, I got the job, I actually said, do you? Did you notice on my resume that I don't know anything about computers? And I understand the concepts that you explained to me about the role. But I don't know any of this. Yeah. And, and the manager had to tell me. Yeah. Yes, I understand. But he said, Camila, I can teach you if you're if you're interested mm. in, you know, I can teach you the computer stuff and the job in six months. Mm. But I cannot teach somebody to be fluent in English in six months. Right. Yeah, so yeah. they could be a master computer person. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. So I was like, ah, okay. And it worked for me. Yeah. I that was a surprise to me. Mm. Like that I actually did very well on the techno the technology That's aspect. Awesome. Yeah. There's so much talk of like gatekeeping in our industry, right? And and you know, all of that type of stuff and it again it just shows like you don't you don't have to have a traditional like you you know i'm going to go to university to do information security or information whatever 
and and sort of progress up the ladder that way. There are other paths um, kind of into into this industry. I love it. It's awesome. Every single one of our guests has struggled with some form of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I good enough to do what I do? And would you speak to the person who's listening to you going, could I do cyber? Could I do security? What would you tell them? I tell, uh, I, I, I fell out of that. I'm like, I'm not going to buy this anymore about me feeling, because the feeling exists, mm. but I'm not going to listen to it. Mm. And, uh, and yes, you can do cyber. I say this to everybody in any job, by the way. Yeah. It doesn't even matter if you're an accountant. It doesn't even matter if you are a cook. Mm. I don't know. Cyber is everywhere because you just have to be attentive. Mm -hmm. You just have to pay attention on what the things that are not really supposed to be happening in my environment right now. Mm. It happens everywhere. And for the people that are trying to get into cyber, I say the same. I'm like, there is something in what you do that is security related. Mm. Just start doing that, like on the side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, oh, oh, you are a printer admin. Mm. Okay. You're fixing printers all day long. No problem. Start seeing where these printers connect to. Are they connecting to your corp network? Do, are they VLAN'd out? Mm. Start telling the, your architects, hey, did you know that this printer is connecting to our backend data, databases? And, you know, like, and these printers haven't been patched in 20 years? Yeah. Mm. Tell them that. See where it takes you, because it will take you somewhere. Like, take a little project that aligns, and you will find a security-related thing in anything you do. That's true. That's my tip. Get started. Don't be afraid. You will surprise yourself mm -hmm. on how much you could know that you didn't know you could know. You're just going to do it. That's awesome. We should ask the plug a question. Yes. I don't know what that is. Not I'm afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid. Um, well, you've shared a lot of great information, I guess, uh, on, on the episode. And, and uh, you know, we'll catch, put all the links in the show notes for people to, who need to visit and, and see. But is there anything else that you wanted to sort of share or plug, um, you know, before we wrap up the episode? Any great resources any 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 other tips anything like that twitter handles social medias if you want me to out, on, yes follow me well you can definitely follow follow me no you can just add me on linkedin i love the linkedin platform to keep in touch uh see what you guys see what i'm doing you can get in touch with me i see what you're doing i get in touch with you so it's camila c martins at the end of the link the linkedin you know url uh, and I like to say there is an aka.ms slash SSC deploy. This is our POC, a proof of concept guide. So it will give you step-by-step -step all of the, the pre-requirements for you to run this and POC it yourself. Go there, check it out, uh, run a lab, see if it works for you. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Ah, if you are a Microsoft services partner, Microsoft's partner that provides services to customers. Mm -hmm. I am working on enabling you to have everything you need to bring this to your customers. Mm -hmm. So you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's perfect. Uh, and then we can work on the site for that. I get you in with the private previews and stuff, you know. Yeah. So reach out. Oops. I just want to say to any of the Microsoft partners who are listening to this that there is an awesome preview program, not just for Microsoft partners, but also for customers. And if you're a Microsoft partner, you should be on those previews and that, if memory serves me, is aka.ms forward slash ccp. CCP, possibly, yes. Could be. Uh, if I got it wrong, I'll correct in the show notes. Perfect. All right. Well, we know you've got an audience waiting for you and you've got to run. Quite literally. So, I know. Oh, my God. So, we will uh, we will let you go five minutes before uh, earlier than promised. I'll be okay. <laughs> I'll I will be ready with my AV problems coming us back. <laughs> yes. But we we want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us. We've had technical difficulties on this show, and you've uh, just cruised through those. So thank you so much. And uh, when the product is ready, <laughs> we'd maybe like to talk to you again. I would love that. Perfect. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your obrigado. De nada. <laughs>